The idea for No Man's Land um, was very simple, and that was to show women's photographic viewpoints on the First World War. There's six photographers in the show, three of which are from the First World War period, Olive Edis, Florence Farnborough, and Mary Chisholm. And there are three contemporary artists, Alison Baskerville, Dawn Cole, and Chloe Dew Matthews. When we tend to think about classic war photography, it tends to be black and white, gritty images from the front line, and it's, it's often uh, male photojournalists making work about um, the experiences of male soldiers. So with No Man's Land I wanted to do something different and show the viewpoints of women who have been traditionally excluded from histories of war and war photography. No Man's Land is a term that came into common use during the conflict and um, it meant the, the land between enemy trenches and it was this kind of this barren wasteland. And we still use the term today to, to talk about something that's, that's kind of unknown or ill-defined and it, it seemed to me to be a really good metaphor for talking about women's war photography. Florence Farnborough was a very independent and adventurous woman. She was working as a governess in Russia when war was declared and she volunteered almost immediately to join the Russian Red Cross. She was moving around with the troops on the borders of Romania and present-day Ukraine, and she was very close to combat action. She was also a keen amateur photographer, and amazingly she took her tripod and her um, plate camera with her um, throughout all the time that she was travelling with the soldiers. And she made photographs of their lives, the very difficult um, conditions they were working in. We see images of them in the snow, um, sleeping out in the fields, um, they're celebrating Christmas in the dugout. She also didn't shy away from the horrors of war as well, so there were quite a number of images that show dead soldiers after the fighting or being prepared for burial. So she was very aware of the horrors of war and certainly the historical significance of what she was doing. I'd gone round to my mum's after my sisters had cleared out the loft and discovered a suitcase in the hallway ready to go to the tip. Opened it up only to discover it was full of old photographs. Felt it was something too important to go to the tip. So Clarice um, was my great aunt. So yes, yeah, so she went out to France to nurse. She volunteered in 1915. My mother gave me Clarice's diary some years later. I just knew that I had to make work from it. She was being you know, brought up as, a, as any of girl was at that time, to be a wife and mother, homemaker. Um, and then war broke out. And I think she, like many other young women, saw it, saw they had to do something, but equally as an opportunity to, for adventure. Well, the text and image really comes from her archive. It contains photographs which were taken during her, her time in France and her, her, her diary. But the, the, the photographs are very, I think they're obviously staged. They've been taken by an official photographer and they tell a very different picture. It's a picture, of, a picture of the wounds, the kind of wounds that the soldiers had, as opposed to the photographs which show these very pristine, very ordered, very regimented groups of people of hospital wards with beautifully clean nurses. All of the words that are used to make the lace come from the words that Clarice wrote in her diary. And amputations, etc., is part of a longer phrase that she writes when she's moved to another hospital and she talks about the soldier's wounds are much worse than she'd experienced before. And she simply says amputations, etc. So the idea that these wounds were much worse and yet, so if amputations was the least of them, what really was the etc. What was the things that she didn't say? So the lace piece is actually made out of thousands, thousands and thousands of the words etc. and very few of the words amputations. Were, were they unwritable, unspeakable? It just to me it said far more than those two little words could ever say. Mary Chisholm was just 18 when war was declared. She was a very keen motorcyclist and she met a woman called Elsie Knocker who was uh, also a motorcyclist and they became very good friends. And they volunteered for something called the Flying Ambulance Corps. So they were working in Belgium as ambulance drivers. But quite soon they decided to set up on their own because um, they decided what was needed was a, a first aid post very close to the front line so they could treat soldiers immediately. Like many uh, women volunteers um, who were working in the Western Front, Mari took with her a snapshot camera. For the first time, snapshot cameras were 
uh, quite cheap, they were easy to use, and it meant that non-professionals could take their own pictures. And because of that, we've got an amazing personal record of Murray's experience. The images in the exhibition are taken from Murray's own photo albums. And what's really striking, I think, is how playful a lot of the images are. So she's got a really kind of mischievous sense of fun. Um, quite often the images show her and Elsie and their friends and colleagues kind of having, having good fun together and really making the best of the really traumatic circumstances in which they were working. What's really important about Mari's photographs is how different they are from the official photographs or by press photographers. So at this time, um, newspapers weren't publishing pictures of dead soldiers. They were um, very restricted in what they could actually show the British public. So Murray's view of the war, I think, is really important in showing a different side and, and showing a quite a personal and subjective and spontaneous side to her experience of the war. So Shot at Dawn focuses on the sites of execution of British, French and Belgian soldiers in the First World War who were executed for cowardice and desertion. So I went and found 23 of these sites, which actually represents about 75 people, because some sites had more people executed at those particular places. And I went and recorded over a two-year period all these places at a similar time of day and a similar time of year, so they were seasonally accurate. I was commissioned by the Ruskin at Oxford University to make a body of work about World War I because the centenary was coming up and they wanted to mark it in some way. And for me, that was a kind of, you know, it's a difficult question. Um, I had no relationship to the subject. I don't have any family members who, you know, I'd heard stories about in the past. But I knew that it was an important moment to kind of, I suppose, reassess the history, the, the history that we've been given, that we've been fed over these years. And I was just completely amazed that someone could have signed up um, to fight for their country and perhaps even fought for two or three years successfully and then due to some moment of unsureness, mental uh, breakdown, perhaps even something like you know news from home that might have unsettled them, that then you could be court-martialed, um, there would even be a trial and then you would be ritually executed by the very people who you were working with up until that moment. So it's interesting showing work alongside Olive Edis, um, but she was asked to make work about women's involvement in the war. And obviously 100 years later, I'm also making work, but luckily I wasn't pushed in any particular direction. I wasn't asked to make um, a response to female um, experience of war. It, it, it has been interesting how many people comment on their surprise when they look at the work and they don't realise who made it to say, oh, it's a, it's a young woman. Also that there is a sense that, you know, men have the authority to talk about war even if they weren't involved in it, and I certainly wasn't involved in it, but women seem to be seen as having less authority on the subject. So it felt, it felt an important moment to make the work, whoever was making it, really. When you look at a blank landscape in this context and you're fed, as is always the case, the title, which is the person's name, the date of death, the time of death and the location, you actually see images, you see people, even though you're only really presented with a blank landscape. Olive Edis was a remarkable woman. She was a professional portrait photographer and a businesswoman. So she owned her own portrait studio, which was still quite unusual for the time. And she had a lot of um, celebrity clients. She took pictures of royalty. She'd even made a portrait of David Lloyd George, the Prime Minister. But she probably wasn't the obvious choice um, to be a war photographer, but that's what she became. Because in 1918, she was commissioned by the Women's Work Subcommittee of the Imperial War Museum. And they wanted a woman photographer to go to the Western Front to photograph the activities of women who were working in support services for the British Army. And she photographed the huge range of jobs that women were doing there. So um, they were doing some of the kind of traditionally feminine jobs like cleaning and secretarial work and cooking and so on. So on. Um, but um, they were also taking on um, traditionally masculine roles as well. 
It's really important to remember that at this time, women didn't have the rights and freedoms that they have today. Women didn't have the vote. There were lots of restrictions in terms of education. They, there were barriers to them entering professions. So Olive's um, photographs show women at a, a, a really transitional point in history. Um, and they give evidence of women doing um, masculine roles, doing men's roles, and showing that they were capable of doing that work too. So we see that women could be doctors, they could be ambulance drivers, they could be aircraft engineers. Olive Edis took with her a number of cameras, including a large plate camera, the kind that she would have used in her portrait studio. She had a very, very good eye for composition and for lighting. Her pictures are generally very elegant. She was showing um, the work of women in a very positive light because it was, in a way, a kind of PR exercise to show the value that women had and the contribution that women had made to the war. The reason um, I decided to do a piece of work um, for No Man's Land was really based on an early conversation I had um, after I'd finished a tour in Afghanistan in 2011. I'd travelled out there as, a, as an army photographer, a reservist, and uh, it was really apparent during that six months that there hadn't been many women doing that job or being in the role of an army photographer. And I had a conversation with a good friend of mine and she showed me an essay about this photographer called Olive Edis. And it was really important to me because it was a, a pivotal moment for me to understand that actually a lot of the women in history, especially in the history of photography, had kind of been neglected or weren't really in the history books and certainly weren't in the photographic education world. When I joined the military, I was incredibly naive to the fact that I was joining a very male-dominated job. I chose to do a set of portraits for this particular project because if I Google soldier um, in, in a search engine, I get like five or six pages of men in uniform. And I think even now, in 2017, this is still pretty much the case. So now I want a counter response to that, to just do these very normal portraits, no guns, no kind of like running through trenches, etc., etc. I'm not trying to prove these women can do men's work, because it's not really men's work. It's just been perpetuated that way. I really wanted to try and replicate the autochrome process with Olive because doing the history and looking at the research of autochrome, again, very male dominated. But alongside this was this woman, Olive, who was a pioneer who was using this particular technology to create these stunning portraits, which she used as a business model to do work of really sort of well-known people in London. So, and I thought, well, what a fantastic way to represent that by doing the autochrome to acknowledge that this was a really difficult process that she, she pioneered and mastered. It's a real privilege to be able to be part of something where we're bringing it back to life and I'm able to put that alongside her work. We're never actually meeting her. Um, and so now we've created these light boxes, which is exactly how Olive would have shown the work, except now we're talking about a contemporary way of doing this so we can use larger light boxes. Um, we've got the luminosity of of an autochrome um, and being able to do something that Olive would have probably loved to do. We have broke some of the boundaries um, in sort of the workspace and certainly in conflict and how we're going to continue to do that.